the French Revolution. The French Revolution is a very important event. Again, can you hear me? I feel like I'm not. Okay, all right, I'll, I'll just trust it. It feels weird to me. Um, it's a very important event. This was the subject of my study for my degrees. In fact, when people ask me, what do you do? What I generally say is that I study and try to understand how societies morph and change over time. And so my focus has been on revolutionary Europe from at least the 1500s. And my specific writing for my thesis work was in the French Revolution, but from a British point of view. I've had several wonderful professors uh, who I studied under for the French Revolutionary period, both British experts and French experts, and uh, really just uh, loved the, the process and the period. You can make the case, and it is kind of my position, that you cannot understand the past 200 some odd years into our modern times if you do not understand the French Revolution. And in one sense, the French Revolution then sets up a competition or two mechanisms by which one can view this past 200 something years, and that is from the French Revolution perspective or from the American Revolution perspective. There are linkages between them, but there are also deep differences between them. And perhaps the biggest difference one could argue, and I'm a huge fan of France, is that after the French Revolution, France becomes a shell of herself. She, to some degree, becomes schizophrenic, um, confused. And you see this in the fact that in those times, she's had five republics, two monarchies, and two, or if you count Hitler, three empires. And at the same time that we have one constitution that has been amended, they had 15. I'm gonna shut this door just because it bugs me. Hope that's okay. Now that doesn't make France bad. But it just shows us that what happened is from the moment of the revolution, things become tumultuous. And again, arguably, um, France is not sure who she is anymore. Now when this happens to France, she is the giant astride the continent. She had won the kind of geopolitical struggle with the Habsburg family coming out of the 15 and 1600s, and only was finding any competition from the small tiny island to her north. And we'll talk about that in a second. And so you go from this behemoth to a nation that needs to be rescued twice um, in the 20th century, not only by us, but by everybody else, um, challenged by a centralized Europe that kind of coalesces within a thing that we late in the 19th century called Germany, and France in some confusion, if you pay attention at all to modern French politics, to the modern French society. You will often see, most recently with the Yellow Vest revolutions, you will see the French people in convulsions with each other as to what is it we wish to be and how do we wish that to be expressed within our civic structure, right? Again, we don't want to judge them and say they've done something wrong or they should be like us. We're not saying anything like that. We're just observing from the outside and saying, well, clearly they still have not yet settled, although the Fifth Republic has been pretty stable now for the past, say, 60 years, I guess, 50 years since the Gaul. Um, and so maybe they have gotten somewhere, but it still leaves us wondering. Now, this issue of convulsion was seen by my favorite founder, John Adams, and he was there, so he was right on the scene. And unlike Jefferson, who was in love with the French, which is fine, um, Adams was a critic, as you can see from this long quote here. And he was noting in 1801, because in 1801 what has happened is Napoleon has played his cards on the table. Now just so you know, kind of sets you up so nobody's disappointed, for me, when I teach the French Revolution, quote unquote, I'm going all the way to 1814. For me, Napoleon is not separate. There are many other historians, in fact, I'd say the majority of historians consider Napoleon a separate or secondary or subsequent thing. So I'm in the minority. But for me, he is a product of the revolution. In fact, that's a key question. How is he a product of the revolution? Or is he a repudiation of the revolution? And there's a huge debate. But be that as it may, he ends up in this place where he is the dominant figure, and I think that's the dominant figure of the revolution. So I cover that whole thing. So pausing for a second from the slides, we're not getting there today. 
I went back and forth saying, okay, do I do the whole thing? And I'm like, no. And so at this juncture, I'm gonna take us to a final, I think comfortable resting spot, and then we'll see. There's a possibility that later in there, I'll pick it back up again, or maybe I'll just leave you hanging. Like a TV show you fall in love with and leave you on a cliffhanger, and then it doesn't get picked up again. And you're like, wait, what happened? So then you have to read for yourself. But I love this part here, and what he's noting, and I was having a conversation with one of you up there, is he's noting, or what Adams is doing, you do not have to agree with John, by the way, he is critiquing the continental enlightenment. And he says here at the end, the French philosophers understand, it'd be better if I use the green one, I have too many things in my hand here, but this thing is easier to see. The French philosophers understood nothing of government or the system of liberty. When he says French, I think it's more fair to say continental that any town meeting in New England would produce a better constitution than all the statesmen and philosophers in France. Ooh, that's tough. But what he's asking then, and what we're gonna to try to look at today, is how do we go from this, where's it at, go for me, uh-oh. How do we go from, it's gonna have a battery problem, isn't it? I might need to get my own out. How do we go from this to this? How do we go from this moment when we find ourselves standing in applause at the events that are occurring in the very famous tennis court, which wasn't about tennis, by the way, to this moment when those exact same people will openly elect a dictator. This, by the way, I think is one of the fundamental questions that I have in general about my own time when I look at considering what happens in the 20th century it's far easier for me to feel like someone like Mussolini or Hitler did something evil to the people and the majority of the people have a sense of innocence than to acknowledge both of those men were elected to office. Because then, if they're elected to office and I'm gonna be fair, I have to assume that it's possible that I too could become enamored with the political leader and elect him or her to office and then have a troubling turn of events. And then would I have the courage to say, wait a minute, I don't agree with that turn of events, or would I applaud kind of the direction they're going? And so Napoleon's in the same boat. Uh, his critics, both then and now, would like to talk as if he somehow did something to France. But no, he was overwhelmingly elected. So what happened? Well, so we're trying to walk through that. So let's back up to get a running start. In the 15 and 1600s, what we see happening is a Europe kind of dealing with the questions of governance. This has become, this is because the Renaissance has kind of opened up this moment when the old teachings of the Roman Republic and the Athenian democracy have finally come out. The idea we could say most easily as, what is a government of the people? What does that mean? And so they begin debating that. In France, coming out of the wars of religion and the Reformation, they go through a journey with Henry IV, Louis XIII, really Richelieu, and Louis XIV in their guidance of the country in which power continued to accumulate into the central government. Whereas England, if you may know, in the same time period is going the opposite direction. Not willingly, they will fight a civil war at the exact same time, the 1640s, that Louis XIV is fighting for his throne in a thing called the Fronde. Except the English will then go in a different direction in the 1680s, and neither James II nor Charles II will have the same um, character power that Louis, Louis XIV has, that, he will be able to, that they will be able to kind of consolidate power to themselves as Louis does. So we'll end up in the Glorious Revolution. So, in that time period then, the French and, why is this thing so long? The French and the British will engage in what I call the Second Hundred Years War. If you know your Hundred Years War, it wasn't just one war that lasted a hundred years, but it was a series of conflicts between England and France, and this is what you get again. So England and France now are really debating, is for England to some degree, we could see, is beginning to challenge France's viewpoint. This is aided, back to my green slider thing here, once you get to the Nine Years' War, if you note this date, 1689, this is one of the key reasons William of Orange from the Netherlands will accept the limitations of the British 
Whig faction to come and invade their country because William is thinking not about the British, but William is thinking about the French. And he's like, if I get the British Navy in my control, I can then compete against the French and hold them off from the movement that France is making. France basically is making a national move to get to the Rhine River as their borders. And then possibly, Louis might have had dreams of a future restoration of Charlemagne's empire, which would have taken him at least over to the, the Danish peninsula. And they don't get that far because William is successful in the Nine Years' War. Louis dies after this war, which you see here also falls under a thing we call the colonial wars. These, these are the two most normal ways of understanding these series of wars. And these are called the colonial wars, of course, because as you know, being a good American, all four of these involve the United States. And you know the last one, what's its normal name that we call it? Okay. French and Indian War. I'm giving the European side because, of course, we're studying French history today. So, um, these wars will impact both France and England. Both will be in economic distress. The British distress will, as you know, starting in 1763 on the tail end of the Seven Years' War, lead to a revolution. The French will see this moment as their chance for revenge. Notice the French are not helping us because they believe in liberty. The French are helping us for revenge because at the end of the Seven Years' War, I should have a map for this, but I don't, they lost all their colonial holdings. So the Mississippi River over to what we know as the Louisiana Purchase, really from the Appalachian Mountains, there had been a competition going on between the French up from Canada and the British coming from the East Coast, and they lost, and they lost big. And so now with the American Revolution, or we could say the next iteration, although I don't actually choose included in the Second Hundred Years War, but it's a continuation of England and France, what you find is France going, ah, oh, here's our chance for revenge. So they enter support to the American Revolution on the basis and hopes of, A, we'll get our land back, and B, we'll be a smackdown to England. Well, B happens, but what they neglected to pay attention to was that guys like Ben Franklin and John Adams would sort of see through their dreams of getting their land back, and Adams and Franklin and John Jay, of course, were very interested in us getting the land, at least between the Appalachian Mountains and the Mississippi River. So, we kind of screwed them because we kind of lied and broke the rules of what we said we were gonna do. And then when it was all done, the French were kind of left holding the bag of this big payment that they had, but no real payoff. They didn't get their land back. We quickly reestablished trade with England, so they don't even get the benefit of kind of an isolated trade with the colonies. So it kind of goes sour for France pretty quickly. So it is at this moment that France hits his crisis. And this is really where you could say, you know, what begins the French Revolution? And it is this moment. Now this map would be better if the room was a little darker, but just to kind of give us a little background of kind of the country world. This is 1500. You can see France is kind of small. You can even see some spots here. This fact that there's a thing called Spain and a kingdom of England and France, a year, 100 years back, it all looked like this, multicolored. And this actually is not even accurate. See this kind of orange here, right? This spot and this spot. That should be about another 100 different colors. So imagine Winter Park being its own nation, and Maitland being its own nation, and Orlando being its own nation, and Calvary Assembly having its own independence, and First Baptist Orlando down on 33rd having its own independence, and Orange County surrounding all those things trying to coalesce and work at the same time. That was Europe. Does that make sense? We'll go to 1700. It's sort of kind of the beginnings. You see France is growing towards the Rhine, and here in 1800, it's really gone to the Rhine. It won't hold all that land. So, why is this taking forever? So this crisis, the crisis begins because one of the failures of absolutism, failures of kind of a centralized government with power at a single person or small group at the top, 
particularly as compared to a government that we say again, of the people, is that it isolates talent. So the idea of a government of the people is that talent can rise to the top, cream rises to the top, right? But if you're in an isolated system, then as we all know, because we've seen this in certain businesses which do still kind of work in this way, you gotta know somebody. If you know somebody, you got a chance. If you're just talented, you may get picked out, but you may not. And so this ultimately, after Louis XIV, France will never have a leader of that quality. You can almost say Louis XIV was like an A student. Louis XV was like a B minus student. Louis XVI, he's a good guy, but he's like a C minus student. He, he, he's, he's doing his best, but he's kind of riding on the coattails. And so he does not have the capacity to put himself in a place where he could really, um, well, he doesn't have the ability to do what needs to be done. And you see this right off the bat in the struggles because what happens for them is financial problems. Now, before we go any further though, I wanna make sure we understand when we talk about France, because this is a, cru a crucial aspect of the revolution, what France do we mean? Now, at this point, France has three estates. Other places don't use the same terminology, but they have the same concept. And that is, at the top, is an elite group of nobles. <laughs> this goes all the way back to the four 300s coming out of the end of the collapse of the Western Roman Empire. It's established in the idea of feudalism that you have heard of. In France, the church, and this was true elsewhere, but in France in particular, the church had also a place of primacy. And the church leaders played both a spiritual and secular position in the life of the society that we call France. So they kind of had a position. They were roughly 3% of the population. So sometimes when you study the French Revolution, you hear about the third estate. But that's misleading in its totality because just like today, if we talked about you know, the lower 97% of the United States, whatever that might be and whoever describes that, we all know there's different sectors of that, depending on where people live, their background, their educational attainment, what's happening in the society, what's their economic status. And the same thing was true for the French at this time. It is this fact that's going to lead to a lot of confusion for the monarchy as they try to figure out, well, what do we do and how do we fix it? Now, what they're trying to fix is this, the economics. Meaning, in 1787, nobody was really unhappy or would say openly they were unhappy with like not getting to vote. That goes back, back up. That goes back to this. See, one of the things absolutism does, then that second point, is that it is in the Renaissance that then gets furthered through the Enlightenment, this idea that a society that believes in the ability of every individual, what we call humanism, so the society that believes she has the ability to think and process, then, the Renaissance argument begins, then shouldn't she and he, who previously were denied access, have the opportunity to contribute to society. Living in 2023, in the United States, we, we give a resounding yes to that, though sometimes we still argue with each other about when and how and who. Should a 15-year-old be allowed to vote? I've been around a lot of 15-year-olds, and I've been around a lot of 50-year-olds, and I might want the 15-year-old to vote. Right? But that's just a debate we can have as a society. Can a 15-year-old you know, participate in society? Does that make sense for everybody, right? They weren't allowed. But if you're gonna say that they have the ability to process, to think, to dream, to imagine, to take a job, well then should they not then have some cont contribution to civic society? But see, absolutism, maintaining the old structure from throughout feudalism, was like, well, no, why would you do that? So then when you come around then to this issue, nobody in France is really even asking this question. However, the financial disaster that comes out of the, the American Revolutionary period, which is not the only reason France is in trouble. As you can see, they had a lot of issues with, that, uh, with agriculture. At the, this time, the French, the French peasant lived on bread. And so when you know of uh, Marie Antoinette's statement, let them eat cake, she's not being farcical or um, um, 
hypocritical. She's literally thinking, oh, if they're out of bread, what's the next thing that I would eat if I were out of bread? And she doesn't mean like birthday cake. It's just a different type of bread. It's a sweet bread. It is an elite bread. It is a wealthy person's bread, but it's still a type of bread. Does that make sense? Right? So bread is the thing. And when you all of a sudden see that you have uh, prices rising, and then along with prices rising, you have the fact that you have poor harvest, and you have a great challenge fiscally, responsibly, trying to find a way to make ends meet. And quite honestly, the crown didn't have a plan. To some degree, this is because of the system of how monarchs and feudal systems raised money. They raised money through what we would call it taxes, but basically the expectation that the nobility would pay what the crown asked them to pay. As you may remember from England, this is one of the places that the Magna Carta was kind of battling over in the 1200s that then becomes a crucial part of the fight of the 1600s, and that is the nobles wanting the ability to debate the request for money with their king. And they get it with the Magna Carta, and then they'll fight for that with the Tudors and then with the Stuarts in the 15 and 1600s. But most other places, the nobles did not think they had that right. And they didn't have that right. And so you've got this situation, and it gets worse when you look because, you know, here the nobility should, be, should have paid, you know, roughly two and a half million, what we call dollars, and would be dollars, obviously, have paid a little less than 200,000. So the crown is losing money doesn't have the ability to maintain things. And again, when you put in the fact what happens at the end of the American Revolution to where they don't get the, the, the win that they want. They want a financial win in which they all of a sudden would be taking over cities like New Orleans and St. Louis, and they'd be get benefiting from direct trade with America. They're not getting that. So all this kind of works in together. In fact, some environmental historians have looked and said, you could almost say, there would have to have been a revolution as bad as the harvest and the, econo um, the environmental scenario was in France in 1785 to 1787. And the fact that the king had no plan and had no way to think of what a plan could be. And to some degree, um, it's really hard for most of us. I'll say it's hard for me, so maybe it wouldn't be hard for you. It's hard for me to get into where I can stand beside Louis and understand his world. Right? And it's very challenging. I'm, I'm preparing a whole different talk right now about England. And so to stand beside James I or Charles I and try to talk with them and see, like, what is it that you're thinking? It, it's hard for me to grasp it. But they're not thinking, like, stupidly. Like, I just made fun of Louis. He, he wasn't bright. But it's not like he's just stupidly doing something in economic terms. He's operating out of the world he knew as it comes to economics. And so it's very challenging for them to think, well, what should we do? Now then, this then sets us up. Because I want us to understand then from here, what's happening is I want to demonstrate to you how, again, we end up in Napoleon. And the way that I want to demonstrate, the way that I help myself understand best the French Revolution, and to some degree I would suggest all revolutions are like this, is that when you start off, there's a very clear sides, like who's on which sides, this is versus that. But quickly enough, and we'll see this in France, what will begin to transpire is new people will come onto the stage as if we were watching a play. And so here's the character of Louis, and then here's the character of the nobility and the clergy. And they're having a debate in front of us as to what should happen, and who should rule, and who should govern. And then from the side, comes a new character onto the stage. And as you can imagine, because you've been in these situations when you've had a two-way conversation that suddenly becomes a three or four-way conversation, the dynamics change. And in fact, they can change in such a way, as we're gonna, I'm gonna hopefully model for you, they're gonna change in such a way that what was, if you were thinking about it in political terms, what was, say, left and right shifts over time. Does that make sense? Now, I use the word left and right very loosely, and I'm very, um, I'm always concerned when I do so, when I'm talking to an audience that's in a society that has kind of clear definitions of what they perceive in their day to be left and right, and to think in those terms, and I'm just gonna beg you to not apply, when I say left and right, 
or even conservative and liberal or conservative and radical to think in terms of anything with our country because it's that's not the point but it is to try to just tell us you have two people in a conversation so there's a person on the left and a person on the right and what can transpire is these new characters can ultimately weigh down think of it like a scale can weigh down the scale to the point that this person feels completely out of the conversation no matter how much they're trying to still be in the conversation does that make sense and you see this right here so the king decides he's going to call for a thing called the assembly of notables the assembly of notables was in essence the king giving up direction and appealing to the second and third estate i mean the first and second estate to, to come and consult with him. In essence, it's almost like the king was asking for a version of the Magna Carta, because the Magna Carta, as you hopefully know, in no way was setting up England to allow the average person to contribute to the decision making. It foreshadows parliament, and when you get to the 1600s, the House of Commons will make its move to become the thing we know today, where it decides everything, and do we even know anybody in the House of Lords? I don't think so, I don't think I do in the modern House of Lords. Do they, do they do anything? They don't have a role, I don't think. House of Commons does everything, right? When the Magna Carta is signed, it's only about the Lords, right? So this is what the scene of Nodos would be like. It'd be as if he called the House of Lords. And they were in debate. Remember, these guys owe him about $2 million. It's a very large sum of money at that time. And you can imagine, they do not want to pay. In fact, I just got, I mean, two days, like an hour ago, I just got news from my bank about the new escrow bill. Woo, I'm in trouble. I'm going to have to go get another job or something. I don't know. My insurance went up, my taxes went up, one or the other. But I'm about to find some money to pay my mortgage. It went up way up, right? And I don't want to pay that. I'd rather find a way out. That's what the nobility is. Does that make sense? Right? So the decision is made, again, with duress. We will extend our conversation. And what we will do is we will call the Estates General. So back to our slide. All of a sudden, you now bring a third person onto the stage. And in doing so, what was right and left? So if we use right and left, we mean maybe conservative, liberal. The king is the conservative. The nobility are the liberals. They want to change the system so they get more power. Now, there's a backstory for that. We don't have a lot of time to go into. But the backstory is when the kings, Henry, Louis XIII, Louis XIV, accumulated power to themselves as they did so it was the nobility that lost power the people did not lose power they had no power to begin with it was the nobility that lost power again i hasten to go back to england the move from england from magna carta to glorious revolution is a move of the nobility fighting to get power for itself and only late did the people have anything to do with it does that make sense all right, so it's the nobility asking for power. Both the king and the second and first estate, they're thinking we can use the estates general for ourselves because they're a bunch of dummies anyway. They have no power, no say so. We'll use them against the other. They're both thinking I'll get the, the third estate to stand on my side of the teeter totter so it goes my way. That's what they're thinking. What they don't seem to understand though is a third estate, as we said, is a multi-factored, multi-dimensional group of people. And amongst the third estate will be a series of brilliant leaders who are steeped in the thinking of the Enlightenment, both the Continental and the Scottish thinkers, and perhaps best stated by Abby Sayers, this gentleman here. And he was at, they were asked, different leaders around France, to write kind of a, an observation. In his writing, called What is the Third Estate?, becomes the most famous of the period. Abby Sayaz will be the partner who works with Napoleon in 1799. So he's got a long history. And it'll be very interesting to watch his life as he goes from this moment to the moment where he's helping Napoleon overthrow the government. We'll get there, I think. All right, so what is the third estate? Well, it's everything. Well, what has it been up to now? Nothing. What's it want to be? Something. It wants to participate. And so as a third estate is called, what this will mean is for the first time in maybe, well, definitely hundreds of years, there will be an election in France. And there will be an election for representatives. The election will show us how dynamic the third estate is. 
What comes there is not a group of buffoons or farmers or people who are perceived as ignorant, but an intellectual, illiterate, thoughtful group of thinkers, many of them well off. One of the things that's happened in Europe from about the 1400s is the rise of what later would be called the bourgeois, but we could call it more simply the middle class. That there are a group of people who are not noble, not clergy, not, no, not, the, not the monarch, not the monarch's family, but they have wealth. And back to about the 15 and 1600s, your upper middle class often had more wealth than the lower half of the nobility. So you can imagine yourself not just thinking in humanistic terms of I should have a say so, but being quite aware that you have more wealth than the noble who is getting some little say so. And the frustration that's built into that is going to be expressed by these people. Sayas leads the charge in arguing if the estates are going to work, first of all, the third estate needs to be doubled, meaning the number needs to be doubled again because the first and second estate will clearly work together against us. And then secondly, in a much more important manner, which reflecting though, kind of coming from both English and American journey, they argue, Sayas argues first, that each one of the representatives should be allowed to vote independently. Previously, 200 years before, these states voted by a state. Well, if you're in the third state, you see this is going to go automatically. We'll lose every key election because the first and second state will almost always vote together and we'll lose two to one. But if we double the number of representatives and we let every individual vote individually, now we got a shot. The king is not really willing or capable to give the kind of leadership that he needs at this moment. And unfortunately for the king, as you can see there, his son dies. And he goes into a state of mourning. It's quite understandable that he would do so. But not only does he just personally not have the wherewithal, the gumption, the kind of vision to step into this moment and kind of lead, he's not there mentally because he's in a period of mourning and sadness. And so in his absence, other leaders like Abbey Sayers, like Rose Pierre, like Danton, um, like Lafayette, these people begin to kind of operate within these gatherings. Now, they, they all go to Versailles, and they all meet separately. So they're in the rooms having these conversations separately on the halls of Versailles, and they're talking about all the different issues that they're talking about. And because the king did not lead, the decision was ultimately made to A, yes, double the third, and then B, more critically, allow vote by individual. So when that happened now, you've now set the stage for the massive change that is about to come to the country. That change is going to happen in June. In June, the delegates of the third estate decide by vote to call themselves the National Assembly. Now notice, it's just the third estate. They send word to the first and second estate and to the king that they've done this. Again, the king's not really paying attention. He's not sure what he should do. Two days later, the king, though, prepares to make concession. And he's going to say, okay, fine, you could call it that instead of the historic estates general. And probably was going to be on his way to say to the first and second estate, let's meet together. Let's let that happen. However, in a great example of how sometimes history spins on a dime on what is, what is not always an obvious motion, moment. Um, the Boston Tea Party is a great example from our story. There's no necessary reason for the Boston Tea Party except in a decision made in London that had nothing to do with the revolution, later impacting, or on our road to the Civil War. The, the Congress makes the decision to build a railroad across the rest of the continent to connect itself to California and the gold. It has nothing to do with slavery, it has nothing to do with states' rights, but that event is one of the precipitatory, precipitatory main events leading to the start of the Civil War. Right. So what they decide to do is to set up a room where they can have the largest possible gathering of people. To do that, the workers at their side lock the doors. As you can see, on the morning of the 19th, morning of the 20th, 
the representatives of the 30 state come and find their door locked. They don't know the king's prepared to accept their, con their desire. So from their historical perspective, what's happening is the king is prepared to do something to them. Maybe ban them from the grounds, maybe arrest them, something horrible. So they then go to a next door room, which would be like basically almost like a racquetball court or a series of racquetball courts in which they could find open. It was just the nearest room that was open. And when they were there, they made an oath to each other that then goes down as the tennis court oath because it was called the tennis court, although it wasn't tennis like you and I know tennis. And then their promise to each other was that they would not cease to meet together even at the cost of their lives until they had written a new constitution. It's a massively important moment in which you can see the people grasping for themselves the authority that they believed was theirs inherent because, well, just because they're living in a civic structure. It was a massively important moment. Had the king led that moment, had he let them know, I agree with you, we're going to do this thing, had the room not been locked, our story of the French Revolution would go in a very different direction. But alas, he did not. As you can see, he still waited far too long before he orders the first and second estate to join them. And so we now come to the beginning of the discussions of the National Assembly. So you can see now what's happening is the power and the kind of balance between left and right, a conservative and liberal, is shifting to the liberal side. What we started off with, where these guys were the liberals in this debate, now they are clearly on the conservative side or the don't make too many changes side of the teeter-totter. And to some degree, the king's off. He's just over here by himself, not fully insignificant, but no longer a crucial player. When you double the third, you now bring more weight to this side of the conversation. Now remember, who's in the third estate? Bunch of lawyers, bunch of rich business people, middle class people, educated people. These people are not liberal or radical in the way we think of that term being used, but compared to the nobility or the clergy, they certainly were in what they wanted. What they wanted was basically England's constitutional monarch. And if you know the constitutional monarchy of England, that's very moderate or even conservative by today's standards, um, but that's what they want. So we're already seeing this kind of move, or it's moved towards radicalism, and kind of this journey that kind of the, um, the revolution is going to go on. Now, onto our story comes a new player. Because so far, we've been doing everything in Versailles. Now, I, know if you, I don't know if you've had a chance to ever be in France or not. Versailles to Paris would be like downtown London to Sanford, maybe to Deland. Right? So we could get there. You could even walk there in a day or two. You wouldn't like it. You'd rather take a carriage or ride a horse, but you could do it. Right? But it's not close. Right? And Versailles was established, was first established by Henry IV as a hunting lodge. And then Louis XIV, in a smackdown to Paris for participating in the revolt against his rule in the Fraud in the 1640s, had basically moved himself to the hunting lodge and then built it up. And if you've been to Versailles, you know, it's this massive, huge, you know, place. I don't even think palace is a good way to describe it. It's just this massive location, right? But he did that in kind of a snit because in a government of the monarchy, the government or the nation is where? Where the monarch is. So you can imagine then the influence or the tension, or I should say the loss of influence for Paris in the 1650s when the crown moved to Versailles. So this plays a role. Now why does Paris think she's all that important? Well, one of the things is because Paris is, has always been the center of the story for France. This is what's true today. If you watch French news today, and you see things happening domestically, pay attention to where, Frank, where Paris is compared to the regions around France. It's, it's, there's, um, for me, I cannot think of a, a good equivalent. Like for us, DC is not that important. LA, Atlanta, Miami, New York, obviously, are far more important, or at least equally as important, as DC. 
Even in England, which London plays a very outsized role, even there I would say it's not the same as what happened in France. In France, there is a very clear adversarial relationship between Paris and everybody else, or at least a rivalry-based relationship. Here's where we get the first introduction to this phrase you may have heard of, the sans culotte, right? I am wearing pants. If I was wearing, which we might call us, us, us pants we might see us, a, a, a golfer wearing, right, with up here to the knees, those are culottes in French. Sans, if you know your French, some of you do, means without, right? So without breeches or noble pant, noble clothing. Does that make sense? That's why in the painting, the gentleman has on my pants. If you say sans culotte means no pants, then we get a weird image in our head. No, it's not really that. But it's like you don't have on the fancy clothes of the nobility. Because you can't afford it, mostly. Right? Now, these guys had existed for a while. But with the coming of Paris, the sans culotte becomes kind of this um, megaphone of Parisian idea, Parisian viewpoint. Although there still would have been in Paris a wealthy middle class, the growing energy was of the poorer class of people. And so into the story then, you have this moment where France, trying to have this revolution, this is an old map, just you can kind of see where Paris is up here all by herself in this blue. When the Franks came, they're really the first to call. If you've been to Paris, you know where Notre Dame sits. It sits on an island in the Seine River, right? And that is the Ile de France. I mean, that is the Ile de France, an island of the Franks. And the region around it becomes known as the, the Ile de France. So you get this picture of the central power in a place that's on a little island in the middle of the Seine River, surrounded by the larger town of Paris, that believes it and it alone should dominate and direct and guide the people. But of course the king's not in Paris, he's in Versailles. So Paris now walks onto the stage saying, hey, we want to play a role in this. And so in this time where all this is going on, of course, the rumor mill would have been going, and it was going, in a way that was kind of leading people to always be concerned that even though we're seemingly on the road to revolution, what will happen is we will instead find ourselves when the king will finally strike back and like, kill all of us. So there were always rumors about this, that he was gonna be moving troops around. And at times, going into the summer, there were official battalions of soldiers who came to Paris or came near to Versailles, either on direct order or just part of their movements. It is this that in July leads members of Paris to conclude that they needed to take matters into their own hands. So independently of the National Assembly, nobody there somehow gave an order, Parisians decided they needed to strike and be prepared to defend themselves. They knew that in Paris was the old Fort de Bastille. I'll probably start calling it the Bastille because that's how we know it. And there was supposedly all kinds of gunpowder and weapons. It also had been a prison, and there was some hints that there might be hundreds and hundreds of prisoners there, political prisoners, there were like 10. There was, it wasn't even hardly used. It was really a Parisian only thing. It wasn't anything used really by the monarch. And on July 14th, they decided to attack it. They do attack it, they successfully overtake it, um, the, the gentleman who was responsible for running the, the soldiers there, the few soldiers was there, was so uh, beat upon, he eventually begs them to kill him, which they do, and promptly cut off his head and put it on top of a stake and parade it around Paris. And this is the beginning of one of the two sort of famous images of the Parisian French Revolution, heads on stakes. So the message has been sent to the second to the to the National Assembly. We are not going to wait while you play, you know, footsie with the king. We want to demand the changes that we want. So again, new player on the stage. So now you've got the coming colony of thirty states, and now all of a sudden, bam, we're going to move even further to the left towards radical, because now you have the Parisians playing their role. 
So you really now have the monarch, the first, second estates, the third estate, or the National Assembly, and Paris, all vying to who's going to get control. And I mentioned the monarch only in passing. He really no longer has any significant moment where he's going to somehow buy for control in the process. Now, <clears throat> this change for us will lead to a thing called the great fear. And I think the great fear for me is a, a moment to kind of remind myself that I hope my fellow countrymen and women will be aware when we somehow act as if we would love to see revolution, be careful what you wish for because revolutions historically are impossible to control. And so what happens in the great fear is you get this moment where all across France, there begins to be kind of open and wanton murder. It's not what we're gonna to get to with the terror, which is telling, but you get this sense in which people become afraid of each other and they lose that ability to kind of work together. Now, while all that's going on in Versailles, the leaders of the National Assembly are desperately trying to work their way to try to figure things out. And they want to do something to try to let off some steam. So they're working towards a declaration. They'll actually first, in August, make a statement eliminating all feudal kind of position. They'll kind of eliminate the, the, best, the first vestiges of feudalism in the sense of special um, taxes you had to pay, rules about you know, where the hunting lodge was, rules about where you, could, where you could go for food. Remember, there's still kind of an ongoing sense of, a, of an economic food crisis happening. So where can I hunt and find food? And that will happen on the 4th. Then, in August 26th, so three, three and a half weeks later, they will then release their very famous Declaration of Rights of Man and Citizen. I would suggest that it becomes almost like a North Star for them, but a North Star that they can never attain. And this is one of the challenges, and perhaps why they've had 15 different constitutions in the 200-something years, because they're trying to reach something that's unreachable, and they keep kind of flailing around, hoping to find some system that will get them there. But that's just my observation. Other people might not agree. What did it say? <clears throat> it covered the ground that the human political association was to preserve what? The natural and impressive, I can't even say it, rights of man. These rights are liberty, property, security, and resistance to oppression. So you can hear a lock in that. You can hear us in that. But let me go beyond that. Then they go on and talk about that they are going to work for freedom of speech, freedom of opinion. Notice they don't have freedom of religion, they have freedom of opinion, which obviously speaks into religion, and equality before the law, that the law is the expression of the general will. So now this is a crucial thing then. All law should be built only off of the consent of the, of the citizens. But what does that mean? That's something we still debate in our own day. Does it mean our representatives, or does it mean something we should vote on ourselves? That's a question that's still kind of unanswered. Liberty is any activity that does not harm another. This sets out the ground rules for where they're trying to go. And again, had they been operating in a vacuum that did not have what Paris just did, nor the potential threat to the monarch, at this point, they're still looking at what we would call a constitutional monarchy. So the general opinion of the majority of members of the National Assembly is that the Crown will still have a role to play. That's still their general opinion. But the Crown's not really playing much of a role, so they're beginning to have other people in the group talk about, could we get here with the monarch? Not just that monarch, but with monarchy in general. Thomas Paine, who you may remember in writing Common Sense in 1776, had set out the first expression of this, both in American and perhaps even in certainly Western history, that you can't have an effective government of the people if there's a monarchy involved. And he wasn't just speaking about George III, although he does kind of identify and single out George III, but for Paine, he is talking about the system of monarchy in total. Well, they know this, and Paine is beginning to send his writings to France too. He's kind of very excited about where they're going. But again, they're not operating in a vacuum. And they're not op the issues that are besetting them 
have been solved. Remember, the issues that beset them are not constitutional. There's no sense in which they decide, hey, we're having some problems with our constitution, about our governance, let's get together and figure that out. It was all the economic issues. So, in that process, they haven't solved the food crisis. Now to show you then, again, just how out of touch not only the monarch is, but to some degree, various members of the National Assembly. A decision is made in October to have a party. Well, that's fine, of course, but when everybody else around you is in distress from no food, it smacks of you know, wanton mismanagement and cruelty even. And of course, the people of Paris know about it. So finally, in a state of frustration, the women of Paris decide enough is enough, and they are gonna march themselves to Versailles, 15 miles or so, and they are going to demand that the king not only feed them, come with them. So they march their way to Versailles. As they go, the conversation for many of them was that their real problem is not the king, but Marie Antoinette. Now, Marie is a tragic figure in this whole story. I don't really have time to give you the whole backstory for who she is. She's from the Habsburg family. She's from a very wealthy family. But her whole story of getting into the French monarchy is a great example of how women, even women of privilege, had no agency, no voice, no ability to kind of guide their own lives and were just playthings for the men. And so her life, to some degree, becomes a real tragedy of a young woman put into a setting and then accused of things by which she had little to do with. And then, as you know, ultimately, she gets beheaded. This is a great tragedy. So the, but the, the women of Paris are mad at her. So they're going to go get her. They don't start off to get her. They go, start off to get food. But you're walking 15 miles. You've got to talk about something. And eventually, what are you going to do? We're going to bring the king back, and we can't kill him. We're killing Marie Antoinette. Well, late in this journey, Paris at this point has set up its own army. And our friend from the American Revolution, Lafayette, is in charge of this army. And so he's in Paris, he's at his home, and word gets that there are hundreds, maybe thousands of women who are walking to your side. He says, oh no, this isn't good. And so he gets on his horse, takes a battalion of soldiers with him, and they race to Versailles to try to get there. They get there just in the nick of time. The, the crowd has gotten to Versailles, they're already outside, kind of banging on the doors. They want to be let in. They eventually do break in. When they break in, the few you know guards and people who are there are completely overwhelmed. Some of them are killed, others are just pushed off to the side. And they're hunting for the queen. If you've ever been to Versailles, it is a massive, massive place, as I said, many halls and places. So they're just kind of everywhere looking for somebody. There are people of the third estate who work at Versailles, obviously. Some of them are quick to join in, and they know all the secret routes. So this is Marie Antoinette's bedroom, and if you ever go there, this door should be open. It's something that the guys usually like to point out. This would not have been, oh, wrong color. This would not have been white. It would have had the color of the, of the um, wallpaper because where she was trying to go was to Louis's room. This is Louis's room, and you can see, can you see the faint outline right there of the door? So that back hallway was where she was trying to get to to get to her husband. The people who worked there knew of this, obviously, and they cut her off, and they, they captured her. And only the last minute arrival of Lafayette, who the people still respected at this point, even though he's a member of the nobility, and he's able to gain possession of the queen, like her physical person. And then she brings the queen and the king to a balcony where the majority of people are still out there on the grounds. So they can wave and kind of speak, and of course they're getting booed, and things are being thrown at them, but you know, they're still waving. Lafayette's basically saying, hey, I've got it under control. Go home, right? Well, they're not going home. They're not going home until they can make the king come back with them to Paris. So eventually, Lafayette says to Louis, I think you're gonna have to do it, because my couple hundred soldiers cannot kill all these people. And so, the king is taken back to Paris. Now, when that happens, remember, who's all there? All these hundreds of people who are in the National Assembly, third, second, and first to state people. They gotta go where the king goes. 
They can't just stay there and say, we'll keep meeting, we'll let you know, because where the king is still in a constitutional monarchy. It's not, they're not there yet. So where the monarch is is where the government is. So they have to go to Paris also. And as that plan began to unfold within a couple of days, roughly 200 of the more conservative members of the first, second, and third estate fled for their lives. So now think about what happens when they gather back to keep writing on the new constitution. Instead of it being where we started, all right, I'll come, I'll come back to this. Let me go back to my finder real quickly. Instead of it being here, uh, instead of it being here, right, or even this, now suddenly with the coming of Paris, you've lost the most conservative members who, by the way, would have been liberal compared to the king. But they flee for their lives because they're like, yeah, I ain't going back to Paris. Because Paris is a madhouse. And it was. Does that make sense? Can everybody see what's happening here? So now all of a sudden, your whole structure of writing this government changes completely because they don't want to go back there. It will be in that setting, in Paris, that this more liberal, or we might say more radical group of people will finalize the Constitution of 1791. They'll actually start with a civil constitution for the clergy. So one of the key aspects of the French Revolution, and one of the reasons why it continues to spiral into violence, is that they decided to go after the church. Which may seem logical for some of us if we don't choose to believe in a spiritual higher power or any kind of official kind of organized religion. But for France, since the days of the Reformation, France had put its foot down as, we are a Catholic country. We're, that's where we are. We're in. And so even though you could have found many people who might have complained about the excess of power of the upper clergy, the people who probably were mostly elected to the second estate or first estate grouping, my average priest who's saying care me in the parish is a good person, and they're, I like them. Right? And I don't want to give up my religion. This battle over religion, and specifically over Catholicism, versus the French Revolution, will be one of the reasons why the country will now will begin to descend into an open civil war. I mean, they basically demanded the clergy to give an oath to the nation. And if you know various religious groups, and certainly uh, Roman Catholic churches this way, that have structure, uh, the oath is obviously first to the God of that religion, and then if there's a structure, such as with bishops or cardinals, or in the case of the Roman Catholics, a pope, then your allegiance is there. And so now, all of a sudden, there's a whole different thing happening within the, the country, particularly in the rural areas where the church was still strongest. So it is in the rural areas that you begin to have the problem or the emergence of counter-revolution, with particularly amongst the nobility, but even amongst some of the wealthy third estate, who are like, wait a minute, where are we going? The idea that we should get to vote for things, I like. But now, all of a sudden, you're attacking my faith position, and I'm not sure I like that anymore. So it really began to cause dis uh, discomfort and concern for members of the church. The Constitution was a good Constitution. I mean, it wasn't something wrong with it. And it went through a whole series of reforms. Um, it, it's the most important of the various constitutions that we will work through, different governments that we have, for them because of what they will try to establish. And some of those become quite long lasting. So for instance, one of those, I'll come back to this slide here, was they changed how the map looked. Oops, why is this thing going like this? So you went from on the left, the old map of the old provinces as they were understood, to a system on the right where they shrunk those. Now their logic made a lot of sense. What they wanted was for every citizen to be no further than one day's ride on horseback to wherever the central government was for that region. And that makes logical sense. They're trying to make access for all citizens. But imagine, I mean, how long have we had our counties driven, you know, drawn the way we've drawn them? I, mean, I don't know if you necessarily have a love affair with Orange or Seminole County, but you can imagine that some people might be really distressed at just kind of by snap of the fingers, the legislature just redrew the map of the counties in the state of Florida or any other state in the United States without somehow the citizens having voted on it. And even if they had voted on it, you can imagine the losing side not necessarily being happy because what had historically always been X now became something else. 
And so again, this is a sense of kind of turmoil that's kind of got them thrown in the process. Um, one of the things that they will do that John Adams in particular points out that shows the flaw of their thinking was they decide that the new government will be led by a legislative assembly. The legislative assembly will have be voted on, that makes sense. But nobody active in the national assembly would be allowed to run for office. Now again, here's their logic. We want this to be clean and fresh and to look like we're expanding like leadership, potential opportunities throughout the nation. But as John Adams will point out, what they're actually doing is cutting off anybody who had had any experience. One of the things I tell my students, we're talking about why were we so successful in our revolution? And again, one constant, well, two constitutions. So why? Well, there's lots of reasons somebody could point to. But one of the things that I stress with my students is that we had had roughly 160 years of practice of government of the people. From the time Jamestown is established, throughout all the colonies, you have versions of a voted legislative grouping who worked in concert with some kind of an executive power. So that when they got to, not even 1776, Ben Franklin talking at the Albany plan in 1750s, hey, let's establish some sort of a regional parliament. He wasn't speaking something that the people did not grasp. They understood, like, yeah, yeah, exactly, like we do in South Carolina. Yeah, yeah, like we do in Virginia. Yeah, we, can, we should try that. Whereas for France, for Germany, for Russia, for every other nation on the European continent, except for perhaps the Italians in their city states, particularly Venice in particular, these places had had no experience by which the average person like me, I'm just a little country poor boy from East Tennessee, could have had the opportunity to even practice. I mean, when I was in school, we had a thing called student legislature. And we got to go every year to Nashville and pretend to be legislators. It was so much fun. You wrote bills and you voted on things. And you elected a governor. You got to practice, even as a 13 and 14, 15 year old, into what the system of our collective governance theoretically looks like. So that if somebody from one of those states Maybe you went to girl state or boy state, which is a thing that happens in various states. I think it still happens, and the same sort of thing happened is going on. We're involved in various civic groups. You begin to get the practice of what that governance looks like. So that one day, you might be a city council person, you might be a representative, you don't walk into that uh, you know, limited in your experience. But for the French and for most people at the time in Europe, they don't know this. They've not had this experience. And so as Adams points out, they're in trouble. And he references back to an old Greek mythology about the idea of what happens if you sow, put in the ground, plant dragon's teeth. You'll get monsters that come up. And he correctly notes this is where they're going to go. And they do go there. It is bad. But they keep trying to do a, ju a judicial reform, a economic reform, and military reform. So one of the things some, some of you may know is when they come over to help us in the American Revolutionary War, it's to our benefit. And we get help from different groups. And France's army was not necessarily the best army. That would either be Prussia or Great Britain's. But still, but this is going to turn over their army. That's going to be a problem in a few minutes for them. But at the same time, it's opening the door for, again, that sense of talent can rise to the top because of opportunity being open to them. And so that was a good thing. Now, Please click. This should be the end. I should say, ta-da! Thank you very much. Is it made of questions? That's the end of the story. But it's not. In other words, what did they do? They had a problem. The king gathered. It got out of control for him. But still they met. They still had some turmoil. They ended up in Paris instead of Versailles. But they did exactly what they set out to do. They wrote a constitution. OK, let's let it run. Let's let it, do, let's let it happen. But they've almost all automatically sown the seeds of their own disaster. And perhaps nowhere is this seen best in what they do in their foreign policy. And who does this, of course, are the inexperienced members of the Legislative Assembly. Because they did not allow the people who had had the last two years of practice 
of doing some sense of governing work to run for office, the Legislative Assembly was completely inexperienced. And so they're going to make a few major errors in the process. Here's a little map here. It's kind of getting sort of pointing out to you how the revolution moves over time. And again, just for those coming in late, here's where we start, right? So this is the liberals and this is the conservatives. And now we've moved all this way. Paris has really changed things. And then once they go back in, now they're all the way back in Paris, and then they write a constitution. This constitution is far more liberal than anything the States General would have dreamed of writing. And yet in the story, we're not done yet moving. The pendulum moving radical is continuing to move as we go. So what happens? Well, some of it is perhaps natural. The human has this proclivity for gathering in groups. And you have probably been in things in your, maybe in your homeowners association or foundation here at the library. And when you get a group of people together, they're going to break off into smaller groups where there's like affinity for viewpoint that kind of binds them together. And we call these political parties, and the French would do the same thing. And so these inexperienced members of the Legislative Assembly will begin to gather. They will gather in groupings. There's the main four of them that become the most famous. These aren't the only four. There was a royalist group, although they were very, very small, the process. But think about what else happened. When the National Assembly members were not allowed to run for office, think about somebody from Robespierre's point of view, although he's not alone. He just invested two years in making a very major change in the country where he lives. Because he couldn't run for office, what's he supposed to do? Just go back home? I mean, Madison, think about how Madison would have felt in 1789 if he could not run for office. George Washington might not have cared whether or not he was president, but at the same time, he kind of wanted to be the president. Think about our Congress and our government right from the start. If the men who had been in charge of kind of building us from the revolution to now were not allowed to participate. Some of them might have gone back to their lives. Some of them often talked about it. Jefferson often talked about it. Adams talked about it. But you can imagine with somebody, these people, particularly the third estate, having had no opportunity to be involved in government, how they felt. And what they felt was they wanted to stick around. So now you've got the legislative assembly meeting without really the experience and who's around them like gadflies, people like Danton and Robespierre and Abby Sayas and others who are wanting to influence the decisions of where they go. Now this takes us to the Jacobins. The Jacobins in one sense are the birth of all the political parties that emerge that are on the radical side of things. They were initially just a gathering place outside of Paris. But as that group, as a group of them were involved in National Assembly, others who had like-minded viewpoints gathered with them. And before long, throughout the entire country, they had a whole ring of these groups in all the major cities. It gave them a very effective communication tool across the nation. And as you know anything about governance, whoever controls the media, whoever controls the message, whoever can get their message spread the fastest has the advantage Remember, only one of these two words is true, Boston Massacre. And it happened in Boston. But the American story of what happened in Boston was up and down the seaboard before the king ever knew it, anything had gone down. So the message got spread fastest. The Jacobins are going to find themselves capable of spreading the message of the revolution far faster than anything the king could have dreamed of. Now. <clears throat> We haven't solved the problem of the monarch because, again, Louis is not really operating well. He doesn't know what to do. In fact, he initially doesn't even want to sign this new constitution, like it's happening without him. He does eventually, but to some degree under duress. And so the different groups are now beginning to talk openly about what they should do, including eliminating the monarchy in total. Now, for you and me, we go, yes, of course, we did it. I have to stress for you how radical a position it was that we took. When Paine is writing that monarchy is a bad system, nobody on the planet is thinking that. And so for us to embrace that, which is why, by the way, in the first 10, 15 years, there was a consistent battle over was Washington actually a monarch in disguise? And so like he would say things to people openly. Remember, I have no children. 
You can say this openly to try to stress the point. I'm, I'm, there's, there's not going to be a Washington after me. And then when he steps down, you all remember from Hamilton, oh, he's stepping down, we're all afraid, which is true, how everybody freaked out about the whole process, right? And it's like, who's going to replace Washington, right? The reason was because even though we said we didn't want a government with the monarch, we kind of did. And I think one could argue the American story is a great kind of case study in how people can say we don't want a monarch, but most often act like we kind of do want a monarch. Because what's the monarch? The monarch is the imagery of the daddy. And what's good about having a daddy as somebody who's almost 60 years of age? Well, my dad can decide things for me, so I don't have to waste any time thinking about it. And maybe he'll pay for that too. There's something in the human species that we like that. Even if you're old, you still somehow go that way. You don't have to agree with me, but I'm telling you, you go study human history, you see it again and again and again. So what are they going to do? Well, the king, had he stayed weak and out of the way, probably could have been the executive in absentee. It just would have lived out the rest of his days, and then they would have had to come to a conclusion at the time of his death. But Marie Antoinette was reading the handwriting on the wall. She's like, we got to get out of here. This is not going to go well. And so she encourages him to make one attempt to get out and to get to Austria, where her family was. And so they, with some few close friends and their family members, they try to sneak out. They make it almost to the border till they reach the city of Balmain. Now, at several points along the way, they had to go through um, checkpoints. Because again, there's already this tension throughout the countryside of potential civil war even. So the revolutionaries are trying to really clamp down on the regions of France that are not on their side. And they made it through several checkpoints till they got to Balmay. And when they got to Balmay, one of the guards thought to himself, that guy looks really familiar. And he happened to have a coin. And of course, whose likeness is on the coin? The king's. And he's like, you're the king. And Louis, instead of protecting himself, going, I don't know what he's talking about, and trying to, you know, still bluff his way out like, you know, some good spy James Bond person might have done, his honor was like, yes, I am. <laughs> and, of course, they captured him, took the whole family back. The moment the word gets out of his attempted escape or attempted fleeing the country, even those who were moderately on his side were against him. Because to them, it was perceived as him abandoning the country at a time when they had largely said, you can still be our leader. So this sets in motion some of the major change that's going to come from the king. There's a discussion about whether to kill him. or is he, Well, they really decided they should put him on trial. And they initially decided they won't right now. That'll come back to that in a minute. He is forced, as you can see, to sign the Constitution now. So now his name is on it as being the, the king inside of it. Outside, Marie Antoinette's family, so the whole Roman Empire, is, is all that central land that today we know of as Germany and Luxembourg and the Netherlands and all that stuff, is run by the Habsburg family. So her parents and her brothers and her cousins and uncles. And they want to save her. They want to get her. And obviously, all the rest of the lands around France, which are monarchical, even in England, by the way, are concerned with this turn of events of where France seems to be going. But it seems to be heading in a direction that may be not helpful for them as monarchs. And there has been a movement of some of the French nobility to flee the country, and they're known as the émigré. So they're running for their lives. When they're going to these places, they're obviously telling them what they perceive to be these moments of distress that are kind of working out. So into this, into this moment, um, I think we'll skip Burke for a second. We'll come back to this. In 1791, here in August, Austria and Prussia will issue the Declaration of Pilsnitz, in which they basically tell France, don't kill Marie Antoinette and Louis, right? The Legislative Assembly will take this as a threat of invasion, and they will make the poor decision to declare war on Austria and Prussia. Now remember what I just said. 
the nobility has fled, many of them. And remember what happened in the Constitution of 1791. The government, the military was opened up to volunteers. Well, the main reason that was, was because they were eliminating the nobility. In the, the governments of the feudal system of Europe, the leadership of armies was from the nobility. So when you lose your leadership, as some would argue we're seeing with Russia right now in their story in Ukraine, you have a poorly run, poorly managed army. So the French army is going to try to stop the two professional armies, and Prussia arguably the best army, from invading them by declaring war on them. It was a totally mismanaged opportunity, and in the process, this will lead to the kind of coming of the revolution of, this, of the kind of civil war. So let's back up again. I just want to keep showing you this. So here they declare war in seven, on April 20, 1792. Now, when that happens, the war goes poorly, and Paris is unhappy. Remember, where is the government? Not in Versailles, it's in Paris. So in Paris, Parisian leaders, including members of the former National Assembly who were not part of the government, because remember, they couldn't be elected to the government, so they're all here on the side, they begin meeting and decide that the Constitution they just spent two years working on is no good. And they create what was called the Paris Commune, which was basically a government in the city of Paris with its own army to control what was happening in Paris, where, of course, the national government was. They declared the Constitution of 1791 defunct. They declared the king an illegitimate monarch. And they make the decision that we have to go and get the king. So they attack his house, the Tuileries, if you've ever been to Paris, the palace. He's being defended by his guard, and he orders his guard to stop fighting, because these are my people. I'll let them do with me what they want. Instead of, this is important for Napoleon later, instead of the people then saying, okay, cool, guards move out of the way, we'll go get the king. They killed everybody. Capture the king and take him with them. Now this then sets in motion the very thing that both Prussia and Austria were afraid of. So they'll up their, in, their enmity and their opinion and their actions in trying to invade. And with this new uh, constitution being established, I just want to point out to you, this is the number of governments that we've had in five years. So just think of the turmoil that would cause a person as they're trying to figure out what are the rules of what it is we're doing in my country. The Paris Commune will see the danger of the war and they will call for, the first time this has been done in Europe, every able-bodied man to go and fight. This is known as the levée en masse. If you're breathing, you gotta go fight. And it will be successful. At Valmy, they will confront the Prussian army. Now, if you've ever seen videos or chosen to play any of these kind of shooter games where there's zombies, right? And there's a billion of them and there's you with your one gun. And you gotta go run and get a second gun or you try to get enough people and you get these things. And eventually, what happens in all those games? You get overrun. That's the Battle of Valmy. The Prussian army and armies of the 17th and 18th century were highly organized and highly trained weapons. And the way these things happened in these battles, they never were really trying to kill the enemy. The question was just, could you make the enemy run away? What's coming at them, imagine you're on the side of the Prussians, and you see coming over the hill this mob of not a normal army size of a couple of thousand people, but tens of thousands of Parisians coming with pitchforks and sticks and and some of them kitchen utensils, running out the Prussian army. <coughs> but it will work. It will successfully cause the Prussians to turn and run for their lives because they're facing a mob they cannot comprehend. And they're afraid what's going to happen when they, they're killing hundreds of these Parisians. But because the army, at this point, most armies in, in European history are roughly five to 10,000 in an army in a major battle. 
And when the British sent over an army of 32,000, no army that large had been put in the field in hundreds of years. The French are going to introduce the concept of million people armies that will be what makes the 20th century such a bloody experience in all of our warfare. Now, with this, the Paris Commune will demand a republic, and they will work to construct a government of a republic. It will get voted in, trying to mimic us. By this point, though, most, most people in France are afraid. There's now kind of an open civil war kind of happening, and in the process, they're not sure where this is going, what direction this is, this is happening in. So the actual turnout for the election was very poor, less than 20 percent, low as 10 in some spots. And we'll begin to see the people of leadership turning on each other in the process. And this moment is when Louis will be executed, the guillotine will be brought in as a weapon. Now remember, it's very much an enlightenment-based thing. How can we do executions with the, the least amount of physical pain? The whole process of Dr. Guillotine was to think in a kind of enlightened way of doing executions. But it will allow them to do executions in large masses and at speed, because they can put somebody on a board, slide them in, and get them out very, very fast. Yes, it's horrific. Again, if you're somebody who wants there to be a revolution in our country, be careful what you wish for, because you can't control where it goes. And you see there was some attempt to save his life, but not really. And so once this happens, you now have moved to the place where we're going to be real close to ending, and I'll take any questions. Because the convention is going to be taken over as the war expands. And we'll show you a map here, but let me get to where... So this is all the main players here. There's, you know, all the main players in the story here. But this is the civil war that's going on at this time. And as you can see, the purple is kind of where the, where the main areas are fighting over. Here in the Vendée is a very important part. And down here near Toulon, Toulon is one of the major seaports of the French Navy. So this is very, very important for the French revolutionaries to control. The Vendée is not purple, but it is. it should be like purple stripes because the people down here and the people up in here are trying to kind of connect this. And of course, here's where the army's coming. There's Valmay, where the battle was occurring. They will skip past the Republic and go to what they call the Democratic Constitution. So now they've gone from a constitutional monarchy to a Republic to an open democracy. Again, there's nothing wrong with that, but they did it in less than three years. So the people's ability to kind of know what's happening and then live into it. Remember, one of the complaints by the anti-federalists was that we simply had not allowed our government to go long enough. It had only been five or six years, and now you guys are complaining and you want to change it. Well, Madison pulls that off. Since then, we've had no changes. We've had amendments, but we've had no major changes. So in this process, the democratic constitution is a radical change. I mean, look, they changed the calendar. You can get the idea that the revolutionaries are beginning to think we can change anything we want, even how the sun and time works. So they'll begin, this is when they rewrite all the names. So July becomes Thermidor. Right? They rewrite all the names of the months. The Christian connection is broken totally. There's no more holy days that are allowed. They're going to rewrite the names of all the days of the week. There'll be 10 days of the week. They're going to change them all. And they began counting the years. So 1793, as you can see, is year two, basing it off of 1791, which, again, is not the first year of the revolution, but the first year of the new government that they've already replaced two other times. I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy what they're, what they're doing. But you, what you're looking at is people who are kind of moving their way forward in a sense of fear and not a sense of any connection with the total. It's a small, whoever can get in power is the one who takes over. And so where we're going to end today is what you may have known of before coming in, a thing called the terror. Once it got to this point, you could arguably say they hadn't really chosen democracy, but they'd chosen anarchy. And anarchy is a, is a sufficient enough governance. It's really what I believe Rousseau wants, meaning people are so good, they can be left alone, and there needs to be no government at all. And in a system with no government at all, we'll all each other, leave each other alone. Well, if Rousseau really did think that would be what happened, France proves him wrong 
pretty quickly with the terror, in that the terror just becomes a dominating uh, issue of, of, of death and destruction. They'll basically ignore their own constitution and set up the Committee of Public Safety, and it becomes kind of an executive dictator all to itself. So really, even before the election of Napoleon to be the emperor, to be the single leader, the people of Paris have found themselves with a small group of people who have absolute political control, to some degree at a greater grasp than what Louis XVI had. And it becomes a nightmare for everybody. Uh, many of the former leaders are executed. Marie Antoinette is executed. Danton is executed. And you can see, depending on whose research you look at, somewhere between, say, 300,000 and maybe a million people are executed in the next, uh, in, within a year. The revolution had lost control as it had moved further and further and further away from its starting spot of what we say the left and the right. The question was, could they ever get back in control? And of course, if I do the second half of this later in the year, you'll have to come back to find out. I can tell you this much, it didn't last long because eventually the Civil War will continue, and we'll go here, that in 1794, 1794, what's known as the Thermidorian Reaction, so this is July, Thermidor, Robespierre will make yet another speech where he's demanding people be arrested and killed, and his colleagues in the room, people who are in the room with him, will finally decide they've had enough. They'll stand up, they'll shout him down, and then they'll just physically grab him. And then once he's taken, he'll be put on trial and he'll be executed. So it eats itself, this revolution. The French Revolution is a beautiful thing because of what we think of it and it's kind of, um, reaction against feudalism. Like, we, like most of us, I think, would say, I don't want to live in that setting, a feudalistic setting. But I think, and I, I should go back, but I won't right now because we're out of time. You look at what Burke's argument was, or what Adam's argument was, and it wasn't that the French people did not deserve a government of the people, or that the French people somehow were themselves incapable of producing a government, but the fact that they had no training in it and the question was, did, would they have restraint? If you were here last year when we did, I did the talk on John Adams and his views of government, you may remember one of the things that he stressed that was for an active government of the people, you needed to have education and virtue. And if you didn't have those two things, well, that's just Adams, not everybody, had, not everybody then agreed with him. Washington did, Franklin did, Jefferson did to some degree, particularly about education. And Burke's point was, you needed education so that you could then have self-restraint. Now, arguably, we could say leaders like Robespierre and Danton, maybe their lives and the lives of people they represented had been so unfortunate and so harsh and so frustrating that anger and overall sense of violence was a natural outcome. But many in France, and certainly in the rest of the continent, would take the position of, we don't like that outcome. So with the Thermidorian reaction, it's hard to see here because it's so far away for some of you. But okay, just so here's where we started. We're gonna end right here, and I'll take any questions. Here's where we started. We add the third estate, then we become the National Assembly, King kind of gets left out. We go back to Paris. Down here, over 200 representatives flee. So the writing of the Constitution was written by a very much more liberal mindset than this up here. Right? But then, Flight the Marines, Declaration of Pilsnitz, the Declaration of War, these three things kind of ruin this. So Paris takes over, they create their own thing, they execute the king, they set up the democratic constitution, and it's almost immediately overridden by the Committee of Public Safety, which institutes the terror. And then, you can't see it here, but we're bouncing back. If you come, if I do this with sliding, if I do this again, We'll go from here, and the very next slide shows you where that, that arrow is going. But you know where it's going. I showed you that at the beginning. We're going to a moment when these same people are going to elect the emperor. Thank you very much. <laughs>
If you need to go, please go. Um, that if you do leave, please make sure you sign for the library's sake. There's a, there's a sign. If, if it's completely full, pull it over and pull in the back. But I will entertain you a few questions if someone wants to ask a question in front of the whole audience. If not, that's totally cool, too. Yes, ma'am. So Prussia and Austria will stay in what are known as the coalition armies all the way until Napoleon. It's another one of the reasons why I consider Napoleon part of the French Revolutionary story. And they will consistently be there to the very end. They're arguably, although we like to uh, laud Wellington for what happens at Waterloo, the Prussians really are to some degree the key winning factor at the Battle of Waterloo. So they stay involved. There'll be moments when Napoleon's so successful, he'll force Prussia and Austria and Spain to be on his side, but they'll stay involved the whole time trying to defend what they view as the right way to do government. 